together this evening. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are worthy and deserving of our praise, Lord. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. Draw us into a deeper relationship with you, Father, so that we might glorify and honor you uh, more so with our lives, Father, because of the way that you have spoken to us tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, make your way to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be talking tonight on the church, on the God of the now. I'll explain. All right, I'll explain. Uh, we've been going through a series on Sunday nights on the church on, and we've talked about different subjects. If you remember, we talked about politics was the first uh, Sunday night. Aren't you glad we're not going to talk about politics tonight? Can I get a witness? Amen. Um, we talked about the church on politics, and then we also talked about the church on the church, and on and on and on we've gone. Well, tonight, I want to talk to you on the idea, the subject of the church on the God of the now. Now, here's what I'm talking about. We believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is exactly right, the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to talk about what I call the God of now, the God of now, the God of today. Now, all three are one. You can't separate the three, and we know that, right? But when I explain it to children, uh, God the Father is the one we see in the Old Testament. He's the one who is the creator. Now, all three are creator. I understand that. I'm not trying to separate them, but just to try to help us better understand the Trinity, something that is ununderstandable, right? But when I teach kids, I talk about, you know, that's the God that you see in the Old Testament. You know and I know you see Jesus in the Old Testament as well. We know that. And you see the Holy Spirit as well. But for the majority of the time, when you hear God's voice in the Old Testament, it's God the Father. Then you've got the Gospels. That's God the Son. It's Jesus coming to earth uh, to live among men a perfect life, a sinless life, to die a sinless man for a sinful world so that the world might be saved. That's God the Son. And then after that, when Jesus ascends to heaven, what does he promise to send? John chapter 14, a counselor. He, he promises to send a comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. That's a God of today. When God speaks, he speaks through the Holy Spirit Today And so that's kind of how I, I, I try, as best as my feeble mind can explain the Trinity. But at the end of the day, you can't explain the Trinity, right? If you have more questions about the Trinity, Roger will meet you after. And that's light work, and I'm just going to let him handle that. Yeah, I don't remember what Roger told someone to come talk to me about this last week, but it was something really deep. He said, I just returned the favor. So you keep telling them to come to me. So I just returned the favor. There's so many things in the Bible we can't explain. Of course, the Trinity is one of those. But we can explain the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Point number one is the Spirit's Word. Look there with me in Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15. It says, pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Amen to that. The days are very evil in which we are living. He says in verse 17, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't we want to understand what the Lord's will is? I mean, in every area of my life, I want to know what God's will is for my life. And he says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled with the Spirit, be filled by the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music or melody from your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. The Spirit's work among us. We're going to talk about that tonight and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He is absolutely the God of the now. When we meet in the sanctuary and we talk about 
asking Jesus into your heart, which, by the way, I think is still an appropriate way uh, to describe salvation, asking Christ to come into your heart. We understand that Christ is not physically coming into our heart, but he is coming into our heart by the Holy Spirit, right? It indwells the believer. We're going to talk about that in a little more detail before we finish tonight. He is coming into our heart. If God speaks in this room tonight, and boy, I pray he does. I pray he does. The way he does it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Point number one is the Spirit's word. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21 says this, For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths. Don't you like how Peter puts that? This is not a fable. The Bible is not some book of, of fables that we put together and try to find some type of, of truth. And no, no. We didn't follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. One reason I choose to believe the Bible is because it was written by those who lived it. They walked it. They, they were there. Peter was there with Jesus. John was there with Jesus. Now, we know there are others who weren't necessarily right there with Jesus. And we understand the Apostle Paul didn't walk with him on the seashore of Galilee, but he saw him face to face. And so these are eyewitnesses of the truth of God's Word who are the writers of the book. Verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 1 says, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came to him from the majestic throne, This is my beloved Son, I take delight in him. And you, you remember, Peter was there and heard the voice. Peter was there, he heard the voice. And we heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration he's speaking of. And he says, I heard it. I saw it. I was there. It's not something I read about in the book, but I lived it. Verse 19. So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you should know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. How do we have the Word of God? We have the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word, absolutely 110% of it. I believe every bit of it uh, from the cover to the maps. Amen. I believe the Bible. This is God's Holy Word. How did He speak it? The Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit's voice to us right here in His Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, you know these verses. Uh, verses 16 through 17, all scriptures inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The word of God is right when the world is wrong. The word of God is right. How does the church feel about the word of God and the spirit behind the word? He is always true. When the world can't find truth, hey, when the church can't find truth, we can go to the Word of God and find truth. Everything in this church must be filtered by the Word of God, but let's go deeper than that. Because it's fun talking about the church, right? That's everybody, that's, that's everybody else. But let's talk about everything in your life. See, this is the, the Spirit, this is the Spirit's Word to you. In your own life. And the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, don't get drunk with wine. It's bad news, right? We know that. But he says, be filled with the unction, the spirit, the moving of the Holy Spirit. The third part of the Trinity, be filled with the spirit. Why and how? Through the very living word of God. This is the Spirit's book. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit is saying, you've got to read his book. How many times have you heard me and other preachers say and other Christians say, maybe you say it yourself, that God's an open book and he wants to be read. Spirit's word. Point number two is this, the Spirit's ministry. D.L. Moody uh, was to have a campaign in England and an elderly pastor uh, protested, why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's uneducated, he's inexperienced, and etc. He, Who does he think he is anyway? Does he think? He has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. 
A younger and wiser pastor rose and responded, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. And that's who you want preaching the Word of God to you, is someone who is controlled by the Holy Spirit. If you'll notice, sometimes I'm sitting over here and sometimes over there, and then on Sunday nights, for some reason, I sit here. I don't know why. I have no idea why. Most people pick a chair and they sit in it, and, and I don't know why I sit on that side. I've always sat on that side of this. I have no idea why. No idea why, because growing up, I sat on that side. So I, I don't know why. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I don't feel right over there. Now, now y'all who are over there, you're probably right. But you could be wrong. I'm just saying that's how I feel when I'm over there. I don't know why I sit over there. But when you see me sitting there, you'll notice towards the end of the last song, and I usually know when, other than that one Sunday where we really messed it up. Y'all remember that one Sunday when Paul was getting done, and I didn't know if he was done or not because he didn't pray. So you'll never see that again. I told Paul, I said, don't you, you pray. When you're done, you pray. That's how I know. Uh, that, that's how I know you're done, when you pray. And so we just spit shook on that. Well, we didn't. It's COVID-19. You can't spit shake anymore. We just kind of high five in the air over that. We waved and said, that's what we're going to do. Um, but you'll notice right towards the end when I know he's kind of wrapping up. And we know on Sunday nights, for whatever reason, Paul sings three songs. And next Sunday night, he'll sing four just to show us, or two. But, but usually three songs on Sunday night. And when I know he's getting to the end, if, if you, I'm praying. And here's what I'm praying. Every time. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you for Jesus. And the second thing I pray is, Lord, if there's anything in my heart that makes me not ready, help me. Forgive me. Because when I stand up here, it's a very, very holy and a very important time. I knew a preacher one time that took off his shoes every time he preached. And here's why. He said, I'm on holy ground when I'm preaching the word of God. It was a vivid illustration to everyone who ever heard him preach. That he really believed he was on holy ground while he was preaching. Now, I don't take my shoes off. I need all the height I can get. Amen. <laughs> I don't take my shoes off, but I am on holy ground. And by the way, when you enter into this place, you're on holy ground. And by the way, when you walk out that door, you're on holy ground. He owns it all. Spirit's word in your life. The Spirit's ministry with your life. Sometime back, the Associated Press carried this dispatch in Glasgow, Kentucky. Leslie Puckett, after struggling to start his car, lifted the hood and discovered that someone had stolen the motor. <laughs> in the church, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, sometimes I wonder if we could lift up the hood and see that we have allowed Satan to steal our motor church so many times becomes kind of a country club where we meet and we greet and and let's be honest that's one of the things we've missed through this pandemic is being able to greet one another i mean you know uh being able to hug someone's neck who's who's hurting and 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 we just kind of i mean i we we just kind of got over that uh, we're doing it I, I mean i don't know if it's right or wrong but when when elaine was here yesterday for that service i i'd never thought about it I had a mask on because the family had asked for that to happen. and I walked right up and hugged her neck. I, when, I, when I went to meet her at her front door the day he died, when she opened the door, she just, you know, and I hugged her. I mean, I did. And if, if I get a virus for doing that, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm okay with it. I, I hope she doesn't get anything from me. I mean, that, that's what I don't want. But we, we, we missed that. But so many times, that's what it becomes about. And I like everybody in this room. I mean, most everybody. No, no I like everybody in this room. I, I, I love you to death. I, I've given my life to my Lord, and I've given my life to this church. But I'm not here for you. I'm glad you're here. And I hope you're not here for me. I'm here. One, because God has told me I should gather with the church to worship. Two, because I want to hear from Him. I want to meet with Him here, corporately. I can meet with Him privately. But I'm telling you, there's something about corporate worship that I need. And I need to hear from the voice of God. 
You can do it through online worship. I'm not making light of that and saying you can't. You can. I hope everyone who watches hears the voice of God. But the ministry in the church is only found in the Holy Spirit's power. If we ever get to do a one, and just let me say this, I have no intentions of starting a one until at least January. There is no reason to fight it through the fall and through the early winter. Because I think school's going to start, and I think it's going to stop again. I think it's going to start, and I think it's going to stop again. That's just my personal opinion. It may start, and it may never start again until after the first of the year. Who knows? But I'm not, I don't want to fight it. I don't want to fight it. And by the way, the vast majority of parents of young children that I've spoken to, and that Alicia, she's spoken to more of them than I have, are saying they're going to homeschool their kids. Now, by doing that, that just kills our after-school program in the same way that it's always been done. So that's probably not going to happen this fall. And y'all, that makes me sad, but it also makes me excited because we're going to do something else for kids. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but we're going to figure something else. We're going to figure out another way to minister to students during this time. And it, you know, it may look like going to a community and having four or five homes that meet together and, and worship. And that may turn out to be a lot more productive than Awana even was. And y'all know what's going to happen. Awana's going to come out with some type of a program to be able to reach students. It may be better than anything we could come up with because they are literally experts on reaching children. And so I'm waiting to hear from them to see what they come up with because you know they've got to be working on something during this time. But when we came and worked with students on Wednesday nights, if we were doing that without the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit, it was useless. It was futile. If Paul sings and he does that without the unction of the Holy Spirit in his heart, then it's just words and it's just music. Now, he can sing. There's no doubt about that. That is a talent that God has given him. But he needs the Holy Spirit uh, to move in his heart and in his life as he sings. And y'all know this. Y'all know this about Paul. He prays about what songs to sing. He doesn't just pick out songs. He prays about what songs to sing. He, he works on it. He looks at it. And I believe that is a Holy Spirit moving in his heart and in his life. What does the Holy Spirit do in and through his church? The Holy Spirit convicts us. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 11 says this, But now I am going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asked me, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. And can you imagine the disciples hearing this? Well, are you kidding? It's for our benefit. You're our life. You are everything. You are the very existence of life that we have is found in you. He says, no, no, it's good for you. It's for your benefit that I go away. He says, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has already been judged. The Holy Spirit and His moving is a convicting spirit that works among us. Listen, without the work of the Holy Spirit, we'll not see sin for what it is. Sometimes in my life I notice sin feels right. You ever notice that? It just feels like that's the right thing to do. Sometimes I feel like getting mad and angry and just throwing a, I mean, a good old-fashioned South Arkansas fit is what I ought to do. Now, I know because the Holy Spirit prompts me in my heart that that is not right. I know that. Sometimes when I hit my hand with a hammer, it feels right to say that word out loud. Yet the Holy Spirit prompts me back to those scriptures that say, no foolish talking, no coarse, rough words should come from the mouth of a Christian. Sometimes I hear that voice after words, right? This there, it convicts me of sin. It shows me where I'm wrong. It shows me the right way. The Holy Spirit convicts us, but not only does the Holy Spirit convict us, but he calls us. 
Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says, Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Anyone who hears should say, Come. And the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever desires should take the living water as a gift. The Holy Spirit is a caller. John chapter 6 and verse 44 says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. How does the Father draw lost souls and even saved souls to himself? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, who will he draw? I'm glad you asked. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. First of all, then I urge that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and for all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I've told this story before, talking to a, uh, a pastor, and it's a long story, but the pastor had been fired from his church uh, because he was preaching what I believe to be non-truth. Not everyone could be saved. That's what he was preaching. He actually made the statement after baptizing his child that Sunday morning, that Sunday night, he asked his church to pray for his own child, that that child is elect and will make it to heaven. One of the good deacons in that church went to the associational missionary and said, what do we do with this pastor? And the associational missionary said, you've got to fire him. That's not in the word of God. That's too far. And so they talked to him, and he was non-repentant, and they fired him. The day after they fired him, I went on the local radio station. Y'all know me. I just walk right into it sometimes, and I said five reasons why I am not a Calvinist. It ran for over two weeks on the radio station, and I refuted Calvinism, which is the belief that not everyone is called to be saved, among a lot of other things, by the way. That Monday night, he called me and asked, could he meet with me? I'll meet with anybody. Absolutely. You want me to meet? No, I'm coming to your church. And for a little over four hours, he tried to convince me that Calvinism was the way to go. At the end of almost four hours of me, I literally, I just said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I never said a word. Mm-hmm, yep, okay. I see that in Scripture, yeah, mm-hmm. He had four Bibles uh, out in front. Three of them were John MacArthur Bibles, who is a very well-known uh, Calvinist. When we got through with that conversation, I said, what about the Scripture that I'm about to read to you? And this is what he said, and I quote, I don't know, I've never read that scripture. Tact was not one of my spiritual gifts early on in the ministry. I still lack in that area of my life sometimes. And I looked at him and said, you, sir, have come to a gunfight carrying a knife if you have not read the word of God. Then I began to quote a few things from John Calvin to him which is, by the way, the man that they named Calvinism after, he had also not read John Calvin. And he left. And he got mad. And he came back. And it almost got really ugly when he came back. Theology can do that to you. Theology can either make you angry or make you grateful. I believe in theology. I believe in the study of God. I do. I, I want to know more about it. And there's more things that I can't answer about God than things that I can. But one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt in this world is he wants everybody to be saved. I also know not everybody will be saved because God gives us choice and we're sinful creatures. And if we're not in the environment where the Holy Spirit has a chance to work on our heart, the odds of a soul being saved is slim. I didn't say it was none. I said it was slim. As I've seen those who come from absolutely no religious background whatsoever in Christianity get saved. I've seen Muslims in a Muslim nation get saved. 
And we're seeing it even today through some of the missionaries that we support. So God, to God be the glory. God can do whatever God wants to do, and he wants to save a soul. The scripture that I quoted to that pastor, who, by the way, is no longer in the ministry, selling cars at this point. By the way, he also lost his family. He lost his wife. Because he got so deep into it that he couldn't just say, you know, Jesus loves everyone. Sad, isn't it? But it happened. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 was the scripture. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. I didn't have this in my notes, didn't mean to go here, but I feel led here. So I'm glad we're all seated. Calvinist has a problem with that verse. And here's the problem. It's not really that that verse says that everyone can be saved or that God will call everyone. That's not really the problem with that verse. When you say that God wants everyone to be saved, but not everyone will be saved, then what you're saying to the Calvinist mind is that you are taking sovereignty away from God. And that's not at all what we do whenever we say that. Certainly that's not what Peter was doing, because by the way, the Holy Spirit was the unction behind the verse. The issue is, who made the plan? Who made the plan? I quoted from this guy a couple weeks ago, and I, I've, just, I've been fascinated with the change that God made in his life, and he died a couple, a couple weeks ago, and I'm a fan of Charlie Daniels. Charlie Daniels was once asked, how do you write a good song? That's a good question to ask a guy like that in his mid-80s, and he's written a lot of good songs, a lot of songs we can't sing in church, right? But he's written a, a lot of songs. He kind of storytelling songs. How you write a good song? Here's what he said. You figure out the beginning, and you figure out the end, and everything in between is just hard work. That's a good way to describe writing a song, I'm sure. You figure out the beginning, where you want to start, and you figure out where you want to wind up, and then you just kind of figure out the details in between. And in the Christian life, we know the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? We know that. God is creator. So who set the plan in motion? God did. How do you understand the sovereignty of God? He sovereignly set the plan in motion. Now, the question is, how does it end? It ends with God. Adrian Rogers said, for years, the world's not going to hell, it's going to Jesus, right? We're headed to Jesus. That is exactly right. What a great way to say it. Now, everything in between is hard work of figuring out what's in between. But if you've got the Creator in the right place, and you've got the ender, who, by the way, is the same one as the Creator, if he sets the plan in motion, then whatever he plans is sovereignly set in motion. What he set in motion? Well, he set creation in motion, but he also set freedom in motion. He created it. He started it, but he didn't leave it. He didn't leave it. He walked with it every day of its existence, even through today. Remember, the study tonight is the God of the now, the Holy Spirit, who's walking with us. Every person in this room has freedom. You have freedom. You could get up and walk out and never come back to this church. Oh, don't, don't choose that way. Please don't choose that way. But you could. You could. I have freedom. I could resign tonight. But you just bought my daughter a dog this morning. How could I resign tonight, right? Thank you for that, by the way. That's a nice gift. Men a lot. We have freedom. That doesn't take God's sovereignty away. Because, see, he has freedom to take your life at any moment he chooses. And you don't know the timeline, and neither do I. God is sovereignly in control. What is he sovereignly in control of? Everything. Is he sovereignly in control of salvation? Yes. Yes. I was not saved because I chose anything. I was saved because he chose me. You say, well, who did he choose? Anyone who would choose him? You say, well, that's confusing. Well, I don't know why. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Quit making it so hard. I believe 
that we could have more converts in our church if I said, you've got to get on your hands and knees and crawl around the sanctuary, and if you'll do that seven times, then you'll go to heaven. I really do. I believe we would have more lost people who would get on their hands and knees and crawl around this sanctuary seven times than would give their hearts to Jesus because we're human, and we try to make it difficult, something we've earned, and it has nothing, nothing, to do with us. So who does the Holy Spirit call? He calls all. Who will be saved? The ones who call on his name. Who can be saved? Anyone who calls on his name. The Holy Spirit calls us. But thirdly, the Holy Spirit regenerates us. You know these words, John chapter 3 and verse 6. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus said you must be born again, regenerated, made new from the inside out. As the song says, I got Jesus on the inside. He's working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. He is, he has got to be on the inside. When Peter preached at Caesarea in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44, he was preaching to the Gentiles. And the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on those who heard the message. What did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit called and the Holy Spirit regenerated in that moment and in that time. So the Holy Spirit not only convicts us and calls us and he regenerates us, but then he indwells us as believers. First John chapter 5 says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah and has been born of God, born again, literally. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one who's born of him. This is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey his commands. For this is what the love of God is, to keep his commands. Now his commands are not a burden. Because whatever has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world, our faith. And who is the one who conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus Christ. He is the one who came by water and blood. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And the, Holy, and the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water... And the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, God's testimony is greater because it is God's testimony that He has given about His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony within Him. The one who does not believe God has made Him a liar because He has not believed in the testimony God has given about His Son. What is the testimony? That the Holy Spirit has indwelt you as a believer. The Holy Spirit will move in your heart. Romans chapter 8 verses 16 and 17 says this. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Seeing that we suffer with him so that we may also be what? Glorified with him. When I'm talking to kids and, and, and talk about, you know, if God speaks to your heart, speak to somebody, I, I have this question very often. But Doug, how will I know if it's God? That's a good question, by the way. How do I know if it's God? You know what the answer to that question is? The best answer I can give them, if it's God, you'll know. If it's God, you'll know. Hey, in your heart, if it's God, You'll know. You'll know. The Holy Spirit will testify in your heart that you are a child of God. He does it every day in my own life, and I'm grateful for it. Number five, the Holy Spirit seals us. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by Him for the day of Redemption. Number six, the Holy Spirit lights us, illuminates us, and illuminates the truth. First Corinthians chapter two says this, verses six through thirteen. However, we uh, we do speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's wisdom, God's hidden wisdom, in a mystery. A wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. 
None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what eye did not see and ear did not hear, and what never entered the human mind, God prepared this for those who love him. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man that is in him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. You ever said in a message, boy, I hope it's not one of mine. But have you ever said in a message and, and you're, listening to, uh, you're listening to the preacher preach and you, you hear what the preacher has to say and there's something in your spirit that tells you that's not right. That's just not right. And, and sometimes it's hard to pick up on. Uh, and sometimes it's very small. It's very minor, but... Something's not right with that. Or you ever heard a, a message that was preached in so much arrogance you couldn't, you couldn't really listen to the truth that was there because the guy that was preaching uh, sounded so arrogant in the way that he explained the scripture. Almost like, you know, he's on the platform and you're way down low and he's talking down to you. And, and he's trying to work hard to help you as the small mind understand what his great mind can understand. Now, I know that you would never name a preacher, and boy, don't point at me, please, because we all know this river ain't real deep, all right? You get what you get. But the Spirit is what does that. The Spirit is what moves in your heart and says, hey, shh, that, that's not right. That's not right. You, you may not be able to put your finger on it. I mean, you, you may not be able to say, well, now, he said this, it's almost right, it almost sounds. You may not be able to put your finger on it, but something in your spirit will not align with what that spirit is teaching. And by the way, you know there's two, right? There's a Holy Spirit, and there is a very unholy spirit. And if we as preachers and teachers, communicators, pastors of the Word of God, if we're not careful, we'll let the unholy spirit move us in a direction and call it the Holy Spirit. Well, be careful. Hey, you know how you know it's the Holy Spirit? If he points to Jesus. If he's pointing to Jesus. If everything always comes back to Jesus. One of the greatest compliments I've ever been given is preacher, every time you preach, you, you point us to Jesus. Man, that, that lights my fire. Amen. I don't do much right, but I got that right, right? I mean, point to Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit is to do. The Holy Spirit also teaches us, teaches us and shows us the Word of God. John 14, 26 says, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, the Father, will send him in my name and he will do what? He'll teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. And then uh, eighthly, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Boy, that's a good thought. Romans chapter 8, in the same way the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. Just that very thought that God doesn't send an angel, God doesn't send another being, no, he sends himself to step into my place when I don't know how to pray. And he intercedes himself. That's a great truth to know that God sends his Spirit to step into my prayer life. You know the verse or, or the chapter that started this whole idea of unity on Sunday mornings was John chapter 17. The whole chapter is Jesus praying for his church. And by the way, he hasn't stopped yet. The third main point I want you to see about the Holy Spirit tonight, and we're done, is the Spirit's church. The Holy Spirit is a unifying spirit. At Romans chapter 8 says that your spirit will align not only with him, but with someone else's spirit when you come in contact with someone who is saved. You, you'll know it. Now, you won't always know it, but 
the vast majority of the time, if you're walking with God, you'll know this guy, man, this guy's got it. He's just got it. I love being around preachers who have it. I've been around a lot of preachers who think they have it, but I love being around preachers who have it. I mean, they're in tune with God. They, they're getting insight from His Holy Spirit, things that they maybe wouldn't share with the whole congregation, but when preachers get together, we talk about things, and they, they, they'll talk about the spiritual battle that's there, and what are you facing, and it'll be much like the same things that I'm facing in my life because they're walking with God. They're walking with God, fighting against culture, fighting against worldliness in their own life and then standing for the truth in the pulpit. The Holy Spirit's church, the Holy Spirit in the church is a unifying factor. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm talking about spiritual baptism. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Now, listen, that means if, if an assembly God man is saved and if I am saved, we were baptized with one spirit. If a Methodist man is saved and I am saved, then we were baptized in one spirit. We may disagree doctrinally on some minor issues, but the Holy Spirit, if they are truly born again, then the Holy Spirit has saved them just like the Holy Spirit has saved me. And we were baptized by the same spirit into one overall body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink, what, one spirit. They're not a Methodist spirit and a Baptist spirit. They're just a spirit. And the Holy Spirit is one. As we too, through the spirit, should be one. Now we have different doctrines. We have different doctrinal beliefs. I stand firm on mine and others stand firm on theirs. But we have one unifying factor if we're saved. The Holy Spirit. Now, at Westside First Baptist, we have one unifying factor, and it's not Westside First Baptist, and it's not water baptism. It's the Spirit. If you're saved, we have the Spirit. The unifying factor in us is the Holy Spirit of heaven. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the what? The unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. The Holy Spirit is unifying in His church. And the Holy Spirit is gifting in His church. A spiritual gift, we all have at least one. Most of us have multiple gifts. We all have at least one gift that is a spiritual gift that is given to you from the Holy Spirit. Not a talent, but a gift. A gift. A God-given ability to serve Christ through and in His church. 1 Peter chapter 4 says this, Now the end of all things is near. Can you agree with me that it is closer today than it was when Peter wrote the word? It, it, you know, let me give you a profound word from the Apostle Paul. It's closer today than it was yesterday, right? And you read those words in the Scripture, you think you had a double doctorate degree in theology before you ever met Jesus. Then you met him face to face, and that's what you give us. Thank you, Paul. That is deep, right? But it's true. It's true. And on Monday, if we all are here tomorrow, who knows? We may leave tonight. But if we are, we'll be closer tomorrow than we are today. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious. Discipline for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Any woman in the room who is married should say amen to that. Right? I love him. And your mama said, have you ever seen him? Do you know who he is? But mama, I love him. Why? Love covers a multitude of sins. That's sort of a joke, but nobody's laughing. Huh? Y'all are tired, I guess. <laughs> Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others. As good managers of the very grace of God, if anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength of God that God provides. So that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Several years ago, 
two students graduated from, from the Chicago Kent College of Law. The highest ranking student in the class was a blind man named Overton. And when he received the honor, he insisted that half the credit should go to his friend, and I can't say his word, uh, Kaspitzak, I guess is how you say that, that last name. They had met one another in school when the armless Mr. Kerspitzkat, I don't know how you say it, had guided the blind Mr. Overton down a flight of stairs. Their acquaintance began to ripen through the years into friendship and a beautiful example of interdependence. Now listen to this. The blind man carried the books for the armless man. The armless man read aloud their common study. And thus, the individual deficiency of each was compensated for by the other. After graduation, they began to practice law together. The individual deficiency of each of us in this room is compensated by others in this room. I may not have the gift of hospitality, but some of you do. I may not have the gift of service, but some of you do. You may not have the gift of preaching, but some of us do. You, you may not have the gifting of teaching. You say, I wish I could, but that's just, not my, that's just not my thing. Some of us do. You may not have the spiritual gift of discernment. Now, we all have some discernment, but some are just a little more discerning, a little more, a little deeper than others do. You may be the blind man, but somebody else can see. You, you may be the armless man, but somebody else has arms. See, that's how the church is supposed to work. We all work out our own spiritual gifts in the way that we're called to work it, and then the church functions and begins to walk. Ray likes to quote me on this. When I ask him a question, he says, hey, I'm doing what you said. I'm staying in my lane. The church is like runners in a race. We all have a lane. The problems that arise in the church most of the time arise because you're in my lane and I'm trying to run in yours. When if we would all do what we're called to do by the Spirit, then the church would function without limit. So I'm going to ask you a question. This is an invitation. Where's your lane? Where's your lane? You say, preacher, we're in the midst of a pandemic. I know. Where's your lane? Where's your lane? You say, well, my gifting is hospitality. I can't have, I can't use my gift right now because they say we can't go over to somebody else's house and we're not supposed to have others over at our house. Really? You mean you couldn't, you couldn't prepare a meal and take it to someone in need and leave it on their porch and then drive away and Give them a little phone call and say, hey, there's something on your front porch. You might, might want to might wanna get that. You know, just a welcoming voice on social media would be nice every once in a while, wouldn't it? I don't know what your lane is. Now, some of you, I think I know what your lane is. I've been with you long enough. I know where you kind of run. And the pandemic, I know, it's hurt us. I know it has. In, in, in fulfilling what we think God's calling us to do. I know. But there's a way to fulfill it. I can't tell you how to run in your lane. I, I can't. I can just tell you how I'm running in mine. I'm doing the best I can with the gifts that God has given me. And when I feel like I can't use them, when I feel like I ought to be at that hospital, but I can't go, then I just... Set aside some time. Pray. You know, I might be doing more doing that than if I went to the hospital. 
find a way to fulfill His calling through His power. And when we do that, church, we will become an unstoppable, an unstoppable church in Cleveland County. We'll become that church that everybody talks about, and not because we had a COVID outbreak, but because we had a spirit outbreak in the church. That's the kind of church I want to be. Isn't that the kind of church you want? I know it is. I know it is. Seek Him every day, y'all. Let's bow out the prayer. We'll have a moment of invitation. Of course, the altars will be open for you to come. But, you know, if you're in the room and you say, Doug, I don't really know what my spiritual gift is. I mean, I know some places that I kind of feel led, but I'm not sure. Well, the only way to get sure is to get into his word through a bended knee. You, you got to seek him. You, you got to ask him and ask him to reveal to you what your gift is and then get into his word so he can speak to you. And he will. I have full confidence in him that he can do that. And I'll be glad to help you. I'll be glad to talk with you and pray with you about your spiritual gifts and help you look in the scripture. But, you know, just going to God sometimes do a lot more than a spiritual gift analysis I ever do. So I encourage you if, you, if you really don't know, or if you know what your gift is and you really feel that you've just been, had your hands tied through this pandemic, there's a way to live out Christ in every person's life. It may look different. There may be that new normal for the Christian of today, but you can live it out every day. There's a way. Get on your knees before God and ask him to show you. He will. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your word and for the truth of it. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a church that is fully functioning by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, the church looks so different in today's culture, in today's time, in today's pandemic. But Lord, we are still the church. The unifying factor that we have is the Holy Spirit's movement in our lives. Father, help us to live Him. God who is moving in this world today. Father, there is a lost and dying world who needs the church to be just that, the church. Help us, Lord, individually to do it. And Father, if there's someone listening online, someone in this room who has never met you as Lord and Savior, and Father, I pray that they would even now Repent of their sins and confess that you, Jesus, are their Lord. That they would believe for the very first time. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, the altars are open. If you need to come and pray, you come. Just as I am without one plea, but but I'm glad we had church today. I'm glad we're able to come and worship together, and we'll do it as long as we can. And uh, hopefully we'll never have to shut the doors of this church again. Um, but do be in prayer. Be in prayer for those who have lost loved ones. Uh, this past week we had uh, at least three in our church that lost uh, loved ones. Or well, one's not necessarily a member of our church, but had been here so long and had just left uh, that he feels like a member of our church. And so... Uh, Y'all be in prayer for those. Uh, the the man who, who passed away in Prim, uh, Stubbs, Bob Stubbs, was a, a member of Jennifer Fife's family. So be in prayer uh, for Jennifer as she mourns the loss of a loved one. And for those of you who didn't know, and I did not know him, I 
I really thought we were praying for an older man, but he's 47 years old. He's a young man uh, that the Lord took and used the virus to take him home, but he was a believer. And uh, so they had his service today up there in Prim. And so just be in prayer for the family, the Stubbs family, uh, through that loss. Of course, be in prayer for the Moses family, also for the White family who have lost loved ones uh, this week. Also, Miss Jean. Has anybody heard from Miss Jean this afternoon? She was supposed to come home today. Uh, the birds are here to worship. Hadn't replied. Uh, she put on Facebook on the on our video this morning that she was watching and hoped to come home. She may be putting something on right now. She may be watching. I don't know. Uh, but she was supposed to come home today. Uh, so continue to be in prayer for Miss Jean, who has been in the hospital. Is there Are there others we need to remember in special prayer before we dismiss? Yes, sir. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Oh gosh, his twin brother's here. Hmm. Are there others? Yes, ma'am. Here he has another surgery Friday. He's so excited about that. <laughs> They weren't here this morning because he had to go take a COVID test to be sure that he's able to go in. And he doesn't have any symptoms, y'all. He doesn't have any symptoms. <laughs> They've taken it just so they can do the surgery. But uh, uh, y'all do be in prayer for Terry this week. All right, anyone else we need to remember in special prayer? All right, as you go throughout this week, remember those in special prayer uh, this week. God bless you. We're so glad you came to worship tonight. We've got a good crowd. We're all spaced out like we're supposed to be, but we've got a good crowd tonight. Thank you so much for coming. I know we've got folks watching online. We're so honored that they would watch with us as well. Let's pray. Father, we lift up every name and every need to you, Father, and we pray that you would heal where that's needed. Lord, we pray that you would comfort where that's needed as well. Father, I thank you uh, for our church that we call Westside here. And, uh, Father, what a blessing. This church is to me and to my family, and Lord, they were this very day. Such a nice gesture. And so, Father, I thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you for every member that we have. Father, I also thank you for all of our guests that are here, not just tonight, but the ones who come in and out of these doors every week. And we're so honored that they would uh, choose to spend a few moments here in this place with this group of people. But, Father, we know they're not here because of us. They're here because of you. So, Father, we give you all praise, honor, and glory for it. Lord, be with us as we go through this week. Father, I pray that you would continue to keep us safe, not just from the virus, but just from everyday life. Father, we're so thankful that you walk with us, that you promise to hear us. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you.